Good morning, everybody. Good morning. We are going to jump in this morning with a topic that um, may not seem that important. It may not seem essential or core to the faith. Uh, because it's not, which is uh, why we're talking about it. Because you'd be amazed at the amount of problems caused in churches by things that aren't core to the faith. Things that are essential to the faith. Uh, in fact, I think in my experience, and probably yours too, most of the conflicts that drive churches to disintegrate or cause major conflicts in a congregation or that really rupture, cause divisions, aren't related to the preaching of the gospel or to the right administration of the sacraments. They're things like music choices and sanctuary redesign committees and hymnal selection choices and instrument styles. I mean, I bet you could think of all kinds of things you've seen over your life where churches have just, people get all up in arms about things. And when you stop and think about it, they really don't have anything to do with the gospel in many cases. They're side issues. But those side issues become central very quickly. And they, uh, they kind of take over. And the, the writers of the Formula of Concord dealt with this very thing. Uh, this 500 years ago in the 1560s, there were major issues over things that weren't central to the church. And what they wanted to wrestle with is how do we resolve, how do we solve, how do we prioritize and decide about issues that aren't central to the faith? And they called those issues, they were, they were referred to as audiophora. Audiophora. Audiophora is just a Greek word, it means non essential or not central issues. Uh, there's a Latin word too, uh, this is the one that pops up the most, and I'm gonna use it, but it's a, it's a fancy word. You sound really smart if you use it, so I recommend you learn it and try to drop it in as many sentences as possible. <laughs> that way people know how smart you are. But uh, audiophora are things that aren't central to the faith, but still cause problems in many cases for the church. So let me, let's get started like this this morning. Let me ask you a couple questions. You can just talk about your table groups. And uh, these aren't deep biblical theological questions. They're just questions about your experience. So let me start with a couple of easy ones here. In your experience, uh, what issues have you seen cause controversy in churches and get people hot-tempered and worked up? What kinds of things have you seen? Uh, not, I don't mean you know just one guy who's always riding the same horse, but I mean people team up in opposing camps over things. What kind of things have you seen people get worked up about in church? Right? Uh, second one, what kinds of issues cause people to leave churches? Uh, again, based on your experience, certainly if you had a pastor who came in and started preaching some false doctrine and was leading people astray, that'd be a good reason to leave the church. But that's not typically why people leave. So what is it that normally drives people in your experience to, to leave the church? Uh, what are the essential matters on which the church can't compromise? In other words, if it comes to this, we don't move. We don't budge on this issue. What would fall in that category? And then, on the converse, what kinds of issues aren't central to the church's mission and message? There's a lot here. You're not going to get to all these. Choose one or two and run with it a little bit. All right, just just get you thinking about this. Mm -hmm. Go for it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when I was an elder, we had. Uh, oh, we were no idea what it was. <laughs> I think you did, because we came in 
You'll get extra credit if you can use the word how you offer at your table. Well, I told my mom she is our contemporary servant. She'll be there. But she's Baptist. So their music is more upbeat anyway. So, yeah, when we go to their like regular service, it's like our. I think it took a long time. No, I think it's here the younger. Eight o'clock. I mean, the times were a huge deal too. Are we going to alternate? I remember it was one week the early service was first, and then they even tried that. The next week the early service was contemporary. They switched tradition so that if you wanted to come at ten forty-five, you would have a chance to do both traditional and so the time was I miss some of the traditional. Yeah. That was a really good day. Oh, yeah. What they should wear, they should wear. Since God agrees with both sides, and we can't seem to agree, well then one of us has to leave, and we're going to take God with us, <laughs> and you people can keep your God, we'll keep our God, we'll have blue carpet, you can have red, because we're not going to stay here and have red carpet, or a blue hymnal. Yeah. Yeah, that was good. What color will your hymnal be? Green hymnal, red hymnal. The blue one. Red. Anybody for red? Then there's the new one. Yeah. 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 Oh, man. So here's the deal. Now, a formula Concord, this is written 500 years ago. And there is a historical context for, for the discussion that's taking place here. And I want, to, I want to spend a little bit of time in that historical context. So forgive me here for talking about a war that you've never heard of. But in the 1550s, right after Luther, di Luther died, Luther died in 1546, and the same year that Luther died, the small Cold War happened. Uh, it happened between Charles V, who was the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, arguably one of the most powerful men 
in history at the time. I mean, he had united almost all of Europe into one empire. It was massive. And uh, Charles V is the one who Luther had to appear before at the Diet of Worms when he said, I cannot recant. This is the same Charles V. Now we're 25 years later. Charles V couldn't deal with Luther right away because he had the Turks on his southern border. He had to direct all his attention to stopping the Turkish advance. But by 1546, the Turks had been stopped uh, just outside of Vienna, and now he turned back to the problem of the Lutherans. Luther died, and at that time, uh, Charles decided to settle this Lutheran thing once and for all and reunite the empire under Catholicism. So he, he uh, marched his soldiers into Germany and got some help from a guy named uh, Moritz. He was a duke. Moritz was Lutheran, believe it or not, and teamed up with Charles. Because, politics, 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 he wanted to be one of the electors. There were five or six electors in the Holy Roman Empire, and the electors voted on who the emperor would be. So if you were an elector, you had a lot of power. And Charles promised Moritz that if he joined him against the Lutherans, that he would make him an elector. He would take the elector away from Saxony the, the, the elector of Saxony, he would remove it from that guy who was Lutheran and give it to Moritz. And Moritz said, fair enough, I'm on your side, Charles. So a Lutheran teamed up with Charles to fight against the rest of the Lutherans. It was a very short war, they won, the, the Charles V won. And um, in 1546, they signed the Augsburg Interim, which brought peace. They signed it at Augsburg, that's why it's called that. And in the Augsburg Interim, it was called the interim because it was the peace until a church council could be called. So this is the interim time. And at the interim, Charles V said, look, Lutherans, here's what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to let you keep serving communion of both kinds. You can use bread and wine. And your priests, your pastors can stay married. You can get married. That's it. Everything else is be capital. Everything else goes back the way it was. Well, the Lutherans were freaking out about this because the gospel and faith alone and the word of God and so many things have changed. And now Charles was saying he had to go back. So Melanchthon, Philip Melanchthon, which is Luther's right-hand man, desperately works to try to save the Reformation. Desperately trying to come up with a compromise with Charles that will allow the Lutheran churches to stay Lutheran and not go back to the capital. So here's what Melanchthon came up with. He said, we refuse to compromise on theological matters related to the gospel. In other words, we are not going back to salvation by works. Salvation is by grace alone. We will not compromise on that. But we will compromise on Roman Catholic practices in the church. So Charles said, you got to go back to wear all the Catholic vestments for every service. Melanchthon said, okay, we can live with that. Uh, Philip said, you got to go back to keeping, or Charles said, you got to go back to keeping all the Catholic hours of prayer, you know, the certain times of the day and the prayers and all the services that the Catholics had, had always had for several hundred years. And Melanchthon said, okay, we can do that too. We will go back to Catholic practices, but we won't go with Catholic theology. Uh, so vestments and prayer times, things like that, Melanchthon said, we can do that. Well, that created a firestorm. It was over things in the middle, this audio offer issues. I mean, the Bible doesn't say anything about what clothes you wear when you leave worship. The Bible doesn't say anything about what times of the day you can pray in. So these were audio offer. These were things in the middle. These were things that weren't commanded by the Bible, nor were they forbidden by the Bible. So can we just compromise on them and we'll all just get along? Well, there were a lot of Lutherans who were furious and felt betrayed by Melanchthon. Very, very angry. Uh, most of that fury came from uh, Magdeburg, the city of Magdeburg, and the city of Berlin. Magdeburg was still under siege by Charles. It had not been conquered yet. And a lot of Lutherans had fled there as kind of like their last holdout. And Charles had surrounded it, and it was a siege. And so the Magdeburg Lutherans were trying to be faithful, and here Melanchthon pulled the rug out from under them and was willing to compromise. And they said, Melanchthon, what are you doing? You're killing us here. You're betraying the Reformation. Melanchthon, for his part, wasn't trying to betray anybody. He was trying to protect the Lutheran pastors so they wouldn't get thrown in jail and, and you know, beat up by Spanish soldiers who were occupying their towns. So Melanchthon was trying to do the right thing, but a lot of Lutherans were very angry that he would just fold like this and, and, uh, and give in. So the central question became at this time, is there a point where neutral matters are no longer neutral? 
No, it doesn't matter what you wear on Sunday, or does it? That was the question that occupied them at this time. Is this a betrayal, or is it no big deal? Right? Now, interestingly enough, again, a little historical perspective here, Charles did not hold control for long. Moritz, Duke Moritz, got the electorship of Saxony like he wanted, but then he noticed that Charles was demanding that they all become Catholic again. Moritz was a Lutheran. He thought he had a side deal with Charles that his lands could stay Lutheran, and then Charles didn't give him that right. So Moritz switched sides, teamed up with the Lutheran princes, and ended up driving Charles out of the country. So Moritz switches, rallies the evangelical prince, princes, they defeat Charles, and the man has to flee, literally, this is true, flees in his nightshirt across the Alps back towards Italy uh, because he gets routed so badly by the Lutheran princes. So at that point, the Peace of Augsburg was signed in 1555, which made Lutheranism legal. Wherever there was a Lutheran prince, Lutheranism was legal. So that was official Roman Empire, uh, Holy Roman Empire law at that point. You can be Lutheran. So it was like a huge sigh of relief, 1555. So the issue of Aliotra kind of ended, but it was still in the background of a lot of Lutherans who felt betrayed, felt that Melanchthon had betrayed them over this issue, and it left a really bad taste in their mouth. The Lutherans got legal status in the empire, but the issue of Aliotra never really went away. So, what's important and what's not? Uh, Martin Luther's Reformation was mainly concerned with bringing the gospel to fearful, hurting, and burdened souls. Luther's main concern always was sinners who were weighed down by guilt and fear, and Luther wanted them to know with confidence the promise of God's forgiveness, the confidence of grace. That was central to Luther, pastoral concern for the weak. Even in the 95 Theses, Luther has several of them that relate to the, the people who don't understand what's going on with indulgences, the bad preaching by a lot of priests who don't know what they're talking about. And Luther's concern was that the people don't know what to do. They don't know how to be saved. And we need, for the sake of the, for the poor and the weak, we need to confidently declare God's grace. So this was kind of Luther's emphasis. Now, if you recall, you know, I've thrown in a lot of Lutheran history here. When Luther uh, faced the emperor, uh, he was banned. He, his, his writings were banned, and his life was, he was declared an outlaw, and uh, could have been arrested at, at Worms. And on his way back home, he was kidnapped um, by his allies, who kidnapped him in secret, because they knew he could get killed at any time by anybody. They kidnapped him, they took him to Wartburg Castle, and kept him there kind of against his will. <laughs> they were his friends, but they didn't want him to get killed, because they saw him as central of the Reformation. So they took him to Wartburg, and they kind of locked him up there. Luther had a lot of free time on his hands, so this is where he translates the Bible from Latin into German, while he's hanging out of the Warburg for a year. But while he's gone, one of his Lutheran friends, quote unquote, Andreas Karlstadt, was back in Wittenberg, where everything started, and Karlstadt said, Luther's gone, so I'm gonna take up the mantle for Luther. And Karlstadt decided to just go whole hog. So he was getting rid of stained glass windows. They're, they're old Catholic things. They got pictures of saints in them. Get rid of them all. So they smashed out a lot of windows. Get rid of the altar. The altar's an old Catholic practice. Get rid of the statues of all the saints. Get, I mean, Karlstadt went crazy trying to purify Puritans, to purify the church of all the Catholic stuff. Karlstadt went nuts. And, uh, and it caused a lot of problems because lay people didn't know what was going on. So one day there, there are statues and stained glass windows and altars and, and communion in one kind. You only got the bread, I only got the, the, uh, the bread. And the, the next minute, there's communion in two kinds. There's no statues anymore, there's no windows, there's no altars. What's going on? Well, Luther came back from the war work after a year and, and he was furious at what Karl Schott had done. Not because Karlstadt was wrong necessarily, although Luther disagreed with him. These things were adiaphora. Whether you have a statue or a stained glass window, that's adiaphora. The Bible doesn't say anything about that. But what Luther was most furious about was the confusion it caused among the lay people. It was too radical. It was confusing to lay people and who didn't know what was going on. And it was hurtful to the faith of a lot of people. And, and Luther was furious at Karlstadt for causing so much chaos. 
Look, Paul Schott, it's not that you're wrong necessarily. We can have the discussion whether we should, whether we should have stained glass windows or not, but if you just decide you're going to get rid of them one day and all the people show up and there's no stained glass and we're ripping them all out, and, well, was it wrong? Was it sinful? Was it not? What, what place does this have in the church? Your passion over Adiaphora has actually made things worse, Karl Schott. And Karl Schott left in shame. He hurt the weak, and Luther was furious. Luther spent, when he got back from the war, he, he preached for eight straight days on Karl Schott's reforms. Eight days in a row, every day, sermons on Adiaphora and what it meant, what was central to the Reformation, and the confusion and hurt that had been caused by Karl Schott. So, fast forward now to the Augsburg Interim, 1555. So we're at the Augsburg Interim. Melanchthon's goal, as I said earlier, was to protect the vulnerable pastors and teachers by reaching a compromise on Adiaphora. Melanchthon was trying to compromise with Charles because he didn't want Lutheran pastors getting beat up, arrested, and thrown into prison, or even killed. But the faithful Lutherans felt that Melanchthon had betrayed them. They were concerned that the liturgical changes were going to send the message that the Reformation was wrong and that salvation wasn't by grace. So one day your pastor's wearing just a white robe, the next day he's in full Catholic regalia. What does that mean? Does that mean the Reformation is done? Does that mean we were wrong? Does that mean we're back to what we were before? I mean, it's just a change in clothes, but what message does that send to the lay people who don't really understand what's going on? So there was real pastoral concern for the hearts of the lay people. So now we come to the formula of Concord. The, after the Augsburg interim, things kind of settled down, but there were still issues about, man, that was bad. We don't want to end up there again when we work with Melanchthon. So how do we solve these issues? So this is what the formula of Concord said. So when anyone teaches, these, these are the formula of Concord, what they write. When anyone teaches that human traditions or rituals are ordained by God, that's wrong. Now, an interesting question might be, what in our church that we normally do every Sunday is a human tradition? Think about that for a minute. Would you, at your tables, quickly just make a quick list of the things that we do on most Sunday mornings that are just human tradition? Neither commanded by the scriptures nor forbidden by the scriptures. Things that we just do because they... They might be helpful for good order, or they might be useful, they might be tradition, but they're not biblically command. Right? What, what would be on that list? Just at your table, let's talk about that for a minute. Now, 
in, in other words, if the church burned to the ground tomorrow, all of it, the whole city block, and uh, there's no vestments, no altar, no stained glass window, no cross, no altars, no pews, no organ, no balcony, no sound system, no banners, no candles, nothing. No handles, no guitars, nothing. We can still have church, couldn't we? We we could gather in the parking lot out here and we could we could worship. That's right. Because we are the church, right? The church isn't the building. Now, be careful before you start running too far down that road. Because on the other hand, aren't those things that we just burned in the ground? Don't, don't burn in the ground. <laughs> aren't those things beautiful, helpful, and provide benefits to people? I mean, it's, it's helpful to have instruments to sing along with. It's beautiful to, to look at vestments on the altar that remind us of the liturgical season. It's helpful to have the pastors wear certain vestments that remind us that they're standing in the stead of Christ and it's not just some guy up there. It's, it's nice to have places to sit that are padded instead of having to stand for an hour. I mean, there's nothing wrong with those things, right? Right? Wrong? Sorry. Correct? There's nothing wrong with them. But they're not required. They are on the author. They are. They, they, they mark out who we are and what we're doing here. When we put a big cross on a pole up, there's nothing in the Bible. You have to do that or put a sign up with, you know, letters. And things. We don't have to do that. There's nothing in the Bible about that. But it marks us out for people who might wonder why we're gathered in the parking lot in the morning. Oh, those are Christians. That's a church. Yeah. So is, there's is nothing that, wrong with it. What's that? Is that on the offer that we don't yes, it is. send this message to, to the community? The message is not on the offer. The, the, the symbol represents the message to the un... I don't know how I want to say it. To, to the, to the unkinked, to, to the unscrambled. I would disagree with you in practice. I mean, in theory, but you'd have to nail it down for me, like a cross. A, a Putting cross, a cross in your a cross, church. A cross, a cross or a fish have become the symbols, the recognized symbols by the American world of Christmas. True. Are they commanded by Christ? They are not commanded. Are they forbidden in the Bible? No. Then they're on the offer. But uh, spiritual liberties, uh, the Christian liberty that we take, uh, we are we are cautioned against the message that we do send to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. That while we, we can eat this food that is sacrificed to the idols because it means nothing, but people who see us eat that food can be turned, can be take, can, can take it in the wrong way, can, can read it incorrectly. And we are warned to be careful of that. Indeed. So in other words, uh, Jesus was crucified on a cross. And that cross is now a symbol for us. Uh, marks out the Christian church. The fish you mentioned for the first century or two was a fish. Jesus it says take up the cross. cross. Mm -hmm. So the cross is, is uh, a central component of our faith. However, when we talk about the cross... We mean the message of the cross, right? We don't mean a piece of wood that we happen to fashion in a certain shape. We mean the message of the cross. Let me let me flip it then. Rather than the cross as a symbol of all of this, the absence of the cross sends what message? That's a good question. I guess it would depend. So let me ask. This is why this is this issue of body offer is intensely practical. Because it's all just theory. You just babble on about whatever you want until you make a change to your sanctuary. And then watch out. Because now it's not on the offer anymore. But that's kind of the point that the reformers were making. So there's a lot of things that are on the offer that we expect and demand that actually are on the offer. So could we have a church with no cross? Yes. Absolutely. Should we take the cross down in our sanctuary tomorrow because of that? No. Nope. <laughs> no. What if you were in a mostly Muslim country and you wanted to gather together secretly as Christians in order to worship? Must you post a cross outside so they all know? 
<laughs> but sometimes. But might you, if you decided to send a message? Yes. Are you required to? You, you see, the, the, it kind of depends on what's going on here. So, can the cross become non audiophoral depending on the situation? The message of the cross is that. How about this one? So I, I wear this cross. But um, maybe there are certain times and certain people I don't want to offend. So I drop it in my pocket when I'm around them because I don't want them to think ill of me. That's already offer. I can do whatever I want with it. Is it already offer now? If I'm embarrassed by it? Now, it's not about the piece of metal, it's about the message of the cross that this represents, and I am ashamed of it in certain settings, and so I tuck it away. It's not about the piece of metal, it's about the message. We're back to the message again. But can an audiophora become not audiophora, depending upon the situation? Yes, and that's what we're gonna talk about today. This is what the reformers were really wrestling with. When is an audiophora not an audiophora? All right, so, so walk with me a little further here. So the first thing they rejected was that when anyone teaches that human traditions or rituals or signs or symbols or vestments or anything else is commanded by God and you must do it. No, 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 they said, no. That's not true. Separate out what's commanded and what's not. <coughs> when anyone imposes such traditions, ceremonies, or commands upon the community of God with coercive force as if they were necessary, reject it. No. You can't say to people, this you must do if you're a Christian. You must have a cross in front of your sanctuary if you're not a Christian. Well, hold, well, hold on a minute. I mean, I agree. The cross is, is a symbol that reminds us of the message of Christ, and, and it's certainly important to us, but as soon as you come in and say, you must do it or else you're not a Christian, now I'm saying, wait a minute, I don't see anything like that in Scripture. So the, the formula writers are very clear that if anyone tries to coerce the community of faith with something that they must do, they rejected that. No, 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 it's the, the freedom we have in Christ means we don't have to do those things, those external things, in order to be Christians. Whenever anybody teaches, these are rejections now, whenever anybody teaches that the church can compromise or comply on these issues when the church is under threat, persecution, or forced to public confession. Who's this aimed at? This is aimed at Melanchthon. They say, Melanchthon, what you did, we can't do that. If somebody comes in and says, Let's say the government, let's fast forward 30 years from now or 100 years from now, and the government comes in and says, that cross on your building is offensive. You must take it down. Whoa. Now, is that cross an audio opera? Yeah. So we can take it down if we wanted to. But as soon as, under threat of coercion or force, somebody outside the church says, you must take that down. Now the church says, that's not audio opera anymore. That's not audio opera. Now, we will, we will stand and fight for this. It's on the opera, but as soon as you tell me I can't, externally force, now remember what we're talking about, we're talking about Charles V and his armies, his Spanish Catholic armies, standing outside of Lutheran churches saying, you must. The, the, the formula writer said, no. No, under threat of force, we don't change those things. We can change them anytime we want, but under threat of force, we have a testimony to make to those outside of the church. And that threat of force violates our testimony. It makes it sound as if these things aren't important, and when somebody makes you change them, you just roll over. And in fact, they were so strong about this, they said, I'll put it up later. I'll put it up later, but I want you to see the quote where they ended up landing on this issue. You got a couple questions here, Katie? Isn't that just the same thing, though, as the practicing the Bible? There is no doubt. Yeah, now we're back. I didn't bring this up earlier, but yeah, now you could be right back where we were a minute ago with uh, this issue of, of uh, Christianity in a Muslim country. So, is there anything wrong with keeping your head down if you're a Christian in a hostile environment? No, probably not. At the same time, are there times when you are called upon to make a testimony for the name of Jesus and it's not appropriate to keep your head down? Yeah, and now the church has to wrestle with when that time is and when it is. In other words, Jesus does not call his people to go get themselves in trouble all the time. It, it, what it means to be a Christian is to be obnoxious to the government until they arrest you. No, no, no. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. 
No, so you don't have to do that, but you Christian. However, once the Inquisition starts, maybe then you might be called upon to make that profession under threat. And you might have to accept whatever happens. So again, these audio offer are slippery issues because on the one hand, we can change them anytime we want. Unless the world says you must. Or unless a fellow Christian says you must. Now, now Adi Afra is starting to slip a bit. Now it's not Adi Afra because you're saying you have to in order to be a Christian or in order to function in society. So, so watch where this goes now. Again, rejections. Whenever external ceremonies are abolished in a way that suggests the community of God is not free to use whatever is beneficial to the church. Who's that one aimed at? Karlstadt. That's Karlstadt, who said, we got to get rid of all this Catholic stuff. we got to get rid of all of it. we got to purify the church. Well, no, all well, these things can be very useful and beneficial. And we reject the idea that these external ceremonies have to be abolished. And we're not free to use them. You can't use stained glass windows. You can't use statues. The church is free to use these things if they are beneficial to building up the faith of the body of Christ. The church is free to use them. Now, if they become harmful, well, now they're not on the offer anymore. But as long as they're beneficial to the body of Christ, they can be used. Now, here's the interesting thing. The body of Christ looks a lot different in different cultures and different times and different places, doesn't it? Which means that these audio offer change radically from one to the next. You go to Kenya and watch how they worship, and you go to Norway, you're going to find two radically different Christian church services. And they're both okay. They're both okay. Because it's Adi Afra. The message is essential, not the trappings. How about the church in old Katie versus the church in new Katie? <laughs> See, we're willing to say, oh, those Africans, they can do whatever they want. They're Africans. You know, those people in Norway, they can do whatever they want. They're, they're foreigners. They're Europeans. You know, it's cold up there. They can do whatever they want. But do you see that church two miles from us doing things different? See that? Boy, we are quick to jump on Adiapa when we see them happening close to home. Far away, we can handle it. It's far away. But when it's close to home, Adiapa get us really worked up about this. Or, God forbid, they happen in our church. Somebody starts pushing something. So these are different. So, what do they affirm? Ceremonies and practices that are neither commanded nor forbidden in God's word are not ordained by God or required in the church. That seems fairly simple. If they're not commanded or forbidden, they're not ordained. And we can either use them or not use them. The community of God in every place and time has the authority. Check this one out. This, this is in our book of Concord. This is the form of the Concord. The community of God in every place and every time has the authority to alter ceremonies according to is that right? Is it AR or ER? AR is the AR is Okay, I'm moving on. <laughs> Ceremon so they have the authority to alter ceremonies according to what is most useful and edifying to the body of Christ. So the question in your context is say, okay, what's most beneficial to the body of Christ here? That will guide our practice. So we're going to set up a new church. What do people need in this community? How can we structure it so that it's beneficial to the people of God? Notice what I did not say. What is the lowest common denominator so that no one's ever offended when they walk in the door and they feel like they're just at a concert and they don't ever be bothered by any church stuff? That's not what they were saying. They were saying what is useful to the body of Christ. What is useful to the community of believers? The church service was never meant to be aimed at unbelievers. It's meant for believers. And that's an important distinction. So what is useful in that context? And let's say we start a church plant up north. There's a lot of growth, new subdivision things going up north here. And, and Memorial decides to start a church plant up there. What kind of church service should they set up? Just like this. Just like this one. Or run out of support now. <laughs> it's Adi Opera. What do they need five miles north of here? That's the question. What do the Christians five miles north need? That's the question. Yeah, they need Jesus. Good answer. That message goes other places there, too, because I come to another community as a visitor, and there's a Lutheran church there that if not, I can go to my, my within my own faith. Yep. And I pretty much expect it to follow what I know here. We do, but it's on the offer. But it's on the offer. 
And that makes it difficult because we expect it and it's not. We're like, what? But what we know as Lutheran is generally the worship practices of our church, and those are ungodly. There's nothing wrong with them. Don't hear me wrong. I'm not saying, get rid of them. You'll hear the formula I say that in a minute. I'm not saying that. I'm simply saying let's recognize them for what they are. They're not commanded by God. They're not forbidden by God. They're all God. They are useful for the community of Christ in this place. Good. Let's do them. Pat? Okay. He's with us. Right? Now, here's where the formula writers were, again, aiming a call shot, and anybody who just likes to have wild whims and run off and try something new. They specifically say frivolous, frivolity, and offense should be avoided at all costs. And special attention should be given to those who are weak in faith. In other words, hey, I've got an idea. Let's take down the cross and let's put a big fish in front. Well, you could make that argument. I mean, that was an early symbol for the Christian church. But I guarantee everybody who comes into church Sunday morning sees a cross gone and a fish posted up on the wall. Yeah, it would be kind of cool. Some people would say, that's cool. And other people would say, where'd the cross go? What's going on? They got rid of the cross. What does that mean? And the fish, we, all of a sudden, we'd have the fish people and the cross people. <laughs> Wouldn't we? You know we would. We'd have the fish people and the cross people. I like the fish. You can't take down the cross. The fish has always been a symbol of Christ. So has the cross. You fish people, you can take your fish and go start your new church by mile over here. <laughs> Oh, man, we'd end up with all sorts. Let's compromise and put the fish on top of the cross. <laughs> it's audiophora. Can the church use the fish instead of the cross? Sure. But when, if you're going to make that change, don't do it just because you think it's a neat idea. Do it because there is a reason that it would be very beneficial to the community of faith, and it wouldn't cause offense, and it would help to support the faith of the people of the church, and especially those who are weak and would be offended and confused by that. So who is our focus on when we make major changes? The weak, those who would be confused, those who would not understand, those who would say, what are we doing? I, I don't understand why we made this change. The focus is on the weak. Yeah, that's exactly right. Alan, very wise, said, what hurts the weak the worst is when the church divides up over fishing crosses. And we start arguing with each other, and the weak say, what am I doing here? I don't, this is not what I want. The weak don't understand, they get caught up in this, and then they end up leaving and they say, you know what, I was part of a church once, I haven't been back since. All we do is argue bigger with fishes and crosses. Yeah. That was their, that was the, the, the focus of the writers of the formula. They said, you must, must, when you're dealing with Audiopera, you've got to think about the weak. You've got to think about what message it sends, you've got to think about this is an important change because it will edify faith, or you're just changing it because you think it'd be fun. Uh, at the seminary, they spent a lot of time harping on seminarians about this. Is the confession on the Well, not about the central issues of faith, no. Oh, confession is for the Yes, because the order of service isn't commanded or forbidden at all. In fact, and this is actually useful, Tim, right? <coughs> this is actually useful. Tim asked if we didn't have confession today. Did you notice that? I, I didn't have anything to do with that, that's <laughs> But it's audio opera. Is that for the weak? So they don't like to see how bad they are and the legs they don't like it? No, no. In fact, we do it almost every single Sunday. In fact, it was quite bizarre that we didn't have it. I don't mean bizarre in that way. I just mean it was unique. It was unusual that we didn't have it. Because we usually do it on Sunday. But it's audio opera. And I, the pastor designed the service. Quite honestly, I don't know why he didn't include it today. It might have been a good liturgical reason. I'm not sure. But, uh, but it's, it's already happened. In fact, that confession of sins did not work its way into the service until the 1600s, 1700s. It was, that's new. That's in, well, new in the history of the church. <laughs> in fact, it might have been the 1800s when the confession worked its way in. Because here's what happened. Confession in the Middle Ages was always what kind? personal individual confession. If you went to confession, it was you and the pastor, you and the priest. Well, after the Lutherans said, saved by grace, you don't have to make confession. The Catholic Church said, you must make confession at least once a year, or else you can't come to communion and you can't be saved. The Lutherans said, no, you can't make people go to confession, and you know what everybody did? Thank God we don't have to go to confession anymore. <laughs> and they never went to confession. And then the Lutherans went, man, what do we do now? Nobody's coming to confession. 
and, and yet they were taking the Lord's Supper, but they weren't going to confession. What do we do about this problem? And so they created a brand new part of the service called the confession. They slapped it on the front of the service. It was meant for communion Sundays so that people had a chance to confess and be absolved before they went to communion. But it was a brand new part of the service. It had never existed. The service was always the service of the word, where the preaching was, and the service of the sacrament, where the sacrament was. That was it. Two parts. All of a sudden, confession absolution slapped on before the service of the word. Brand new. Innovation. Why did they make that major change? Because it was beneficial to the faith of people who weren't going to confession individually, but were still taking communion, and they wanted them to confess and be absolved. But it was an innovation at the time. It was brand new. Nowadays, if you take it out, everybody thinks Jesus put it in there. I mean, really, it's like you alter the service. Whoa, you can How can you have a service and not have a gospel reading? Could you? And you could, but I bet some people get kind of offended by it, right? But you do whatever you want. What's beneficial to the faith of the people in the worshiping community? And of course, most weeks it's very beneficial to read the gospel. But would you have to? No. So today we didn't do a confession absolution. That's right, we did. I didn't notice that. Okay. <laughs> You're right, we did. I mean, don't, don't be offended by that. I'm trying to figure out, there's you know, all kinds of things going on. I usually don't see the service until like Wednesday before and Sunday morning. So yeah, I didn't notice that. We didn't agree either. Do you have to agree? No. Yeah, yeah. those of you that have been in the late service, like, what is going on around here? <laughs> it's okay, you'll be fine. Yeah. So, if you're going to make a change, don't do it in a way that causes offense to the weak, and don't do it with frivolity for no reason just because you thought it was a neat idea. Don't do that. However, this is where the formula writers switch gears. During times of persecution, when a confession or practice is demanded, we dare not yield on our yacht. This, this term is sudden and pretty severe, but there's a good reason for it. What are they thinking of when they say this? What are they thinking of? They're thinking of Charles V. They're thinking armies at the gates. You will go back to the Catholic practices. That's what they're thinking. Another thing they were thinking that came up later, but this was useful at that time, uh, the Peace of Augsburg provided for Lutherans to be Lutheran in Lutheran lands. Wherever the prince was, if he was Lutheran, you were Lutheran. Later on, the Reformed churches began to take over some provinces, and rulers ended up with some Reformed, some Catholic, some Lutheran, and in the 1800s, the, the rulers of Prussia wanted to unite in Prussia. And so they demanded that all the churches adopt Reformed practices in their lands. That meant Lutherans had to suddenly become Reformed, which Honestly, it wasn't that big a theological change except for the Lord's Supper. Because Reform said he's not present in the Lord's Supper. And the symbol for that was that the, the, the Reform preacher in the service would use a regular loaf of bread. Now, what kind of bread should you use in communion? It's adiaphora. Aha, it's adiaphora. It actually doesn't matter. You can use leaven or unleavened. It's not commanded either way. The Bible wasn't commanded. But the Lutherans tended to use the, the wafer-thin, almost pita-like bread. But when the Reform came in, the symbol for the Reform churches to signal to the congregation that it was a Reform person leading the service, they used a regular loaf of bread. And they break it up front. Well, the Lutherans said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Bread is audiophora, but not when you force it on us. Because now it isn't just about bread. This is about the testimony of the Lord's Supper. And so the Lutherans went to bat over this issue. In fact, a lot of them ended up emigrating to the United States at that time. Hence, the Missouri Synod in Perry County, Missouri, leaving Saxony because of this forced use of the Lord's Supper in a certain way, that, that their pastors didn't believe in the real presence. So which bread should you use? It's Adiaphora, unless somebody makes you choose one. Now it's not Adiaphora. So in such situations, these are no longer in different matters. The truth of the gospel, Christian freedom, and the protection of the weak are at stake. The government says, you've got to take that cross off your building. It causes offense. We don't want that anymore. And we take the cross down. What does that say to the weak? What does that say to those who aren't sure? What does that say to the confused? It says that we just yield to pressure. It's not really that big a deal. Is a cross on your building a big deal? Not necessarily, unless the government says, you will not, you may not, you must not. 
Now you kind of forced our hand. Now if we take it down, it looks like it's not important. We'll just bow to whatever the government wants. And in those situations, the reformers said, we don't change. In these situations, the church must make a clear, and unwavering confession. And listen to these words. This is their word, word for word. And suffer whatever God permits the enemies of his word to inflict upon us. If they want to fine us, we will have to pay the fine. If they want to tear down our building, they will have to tear down our building. If they want to put me in jail, they will have to put me in jail. But if I compromise on this issue of faith, the message I am sending is that it's not important. That we can, we'll just roll over whatever the government makes us. And it's not a big deal. Adiapha or adiapha, unless it's a force from an external threat. Right. We also confess that no church should condemn another. Boy, this could be... Let this roll around in your head. This is written in the 1560s, folks. No church should condemn another because of external ceremonies not commanded by God as long as there is unity in the proclamation of the gospel, the sacraments, and the articles of faith. If there's agreement on those issues, then external ceremonies do not matter. Now, we might have disagreements over what's helpful to the body of Christ, but if that pastor over there finds that what he's doing is helpful to the body of Christ and is different than what we do over here, leave him alone. Don't, don't badmouth them. Don't badmouth that church. Let, let, if they agree on the gospel, they agree on the sacraments, and they agree on the articles of faith, then let them do what is helpful for the body of Christ in that place. Practices were all over the place in Germany at this time. Some churches were very formal. You might not even be able to tell they were Lutheran. They looked just like Catholic churches, but they were Lutheran. Other churches, you just walked in, and there was no cross in the wall or anything. And they were both Lutheran churches, and Lutheran pastors were arguing about which was right. And the reformers said, don't have that argument. Whatever's helpful in that place for the body, that's what you do. Final, final thoughts. Some things to walk away with. Adiapra are not frivolous. Don't misunderstand me. Having a cross in the wall might be adiapra, but that doesn't mean it's unimportant. So don't, don't confuse adiapra with not important. That's not what we're saying. We're just saying they're not commanded. They exist for the sake of good order and for building up the body of Christ. That's really important to keep in mind. The central issue in the formula is external forced persecution. We aren't facing that. So when we get into dead, heated arguments over which hymnal to use, you can't go to the formula of Concord and talk about an external threat forcing you. No. That's just Christians bickering back and forth. And in those situations, the formula writers urge us to agreement. Is our opponent an enemy of the gospel? Or they just like a different hymnal. See the difference? Is our opponent using real force? Or we just disagree with them? If these two criteria aren't met, then we should work for peace and conquer. What's best for the weak? What's best for building up the body of Christ? Final thing. Rules for handling church disagreements. Number one, let's admit that Audi Opera exists. That the color of the carpet is Audi Opera. And even if we get really passionate about it, it's how you offer them. It's not commanded by God. Let's not get them confused. Number two, church practices change with the times, people, and places, and that's okay. If we start doing worship like they did in the 1800s, you'd think you'd gone to Mars. If we did it like they did in the 1500s, you'd think you were in Saturn. And if we went back to what the early church did, you'd think we were in a hippie commune. That's okay. Different times, different places, different communities, different needs. What's best for the body of Christ in building up the faith? Always watch out for the weak. Never change things frivolously. When hell breaks loose against the church and Charles's armies are knocking at the gates, then everything matters. It's not already opera anymore. Now it's the testimony of the church and the faithfulness of the gospel. But that's a pretty unique criteria, which we are not really dealing with yet. Maybe we will, maybe we won't. But right now, that's not the issue that the church is facing. Certainly isn't over whether we should have guitar or organ. But we treat it like that, don't we? And then number five. Christian unity consists in our gospel proclamation, holy baptism and the Lord's Supper, not worship style, not external church practices. What's on the offer and what isn't? What's useful for the body of Christ? And most important, What do the weak need? How can we avoid causing unnecessary offense? How can we protect the faith of the weak? That's the issue. What does the body of Christ need? 
Those whose faith would be harmed by changing the practice. I love the church. The pastor took out the confession that he recently was that you're walking on the street or turned off by walking in the same hand with that person. Yeah. Was I wise or was I wrong? I, I leave that between you and Jesus. <laughs> Yeah. And these are, is confession on the offer at the beginning of the service? Yes. Does that mean it doesn't matter? No. It means we need to think carefully about this. What is best for building up the body of Christ and for the faith of the weak? And churches can disagree about which liturgical sections to include and which ones not to. But that doesn't mean they're unimportant. These are very important discussions, but they're on the offer. The question is, what do the weak need? And there can be disagreements about that. We happen to live in a time and place where, honestly, if I hack you off here at Memorial, you can drive three miles if I'm in a Lutheran church. This matters a lot more when it's the only Lutheran church in traveling distance. And the, con the writers of the formula are urging the people of congregations to peace and unity, to identify themselves centrally around the gospel, the sacraments, and the confession of faith. And then to think next that Audiophora ring around the outside of those to think what is best for the weak in building up the body of Christ. And where we have disagreements on those outside things, let's work for peace, forgiveness, a willingness to go along with something we might be uncomfortable with even sometimes. You might hate the blue carpet or the blue candle, but we're in agreement with the gospel and the sacraments and the body of Christ. And that's tough. You do. You do. Alan said we get you get strength working through these things, sucking it up, so to speak, dying to self and my desires. I want what I want. Boy, that's hard for us, isn't it? I want what I want, and and if I don't want it, it's probably probably because it's wrong, and I'm pretty sure God agrees with me. See how see how easy that slope is. That I like it, therefore it's right. And God would agree. Ooh, that's what the formula writers would say. Be careful about it. Don't do that. If you like it, good. And if the church changes it and you miss it, that's a bummer. But is the gospel being proclaimed? Are the sacraments being served faithfully? Is the message and the confession of the church faithful? Then maybe it's okay to die a little bit to what you like for the sake of the weaker brother. Don't do things frivolously. What's best for the weaker? Heavenly Father, we give you thanks that you have created the church, the body of Christ, but in that body, we are, we are a confused people, Father. We get divided up over silly things, and sometimes things that aren't silly, they're very important to us. We, we get worked up about it. Lord, we ask that you give us wisdom to know what's essential and what isn't, what is hardy offer and what's not. Give us the clarity and the peace to be able to submit when things don't go our way. Help us to stay true to the confession of the church, the proclamation of the gospel, the administration of the sacraments, and our united confession of faith. And then be willing to think about the weak for all those other things. That your gospel would go forth, that your word would be proclaimed, and that people would come to know the truth of your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for your son, Jesus, in whose name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Uh, she's doing good. Okay, good. Yeah. Thank you.
<laughs> for good and for ill. Yeah. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right.